Okay, so we are in the middle of verse 10. Covered a little bit of it. So, uh, let's start with the. Uh, <clears throat> we're not going to go to the English, we did that. What I'm going to do is we're going to read the uh, translation on the Greek because it's kind of a little uh, um, disjointed, which is sometimes very, very good. And then we're going to jump right down to the words, uh, kind of where we were before. So it says, uh, because you have guarded my word. Remember we talked about the word tereo. Uh, tereo is the word where you guard something, where you protect it. And this is the same thing where the same uh, piece uh, that it has where it says, to make sure that you guard your heart. Uh, and your heart is not your heart heart. It's, it's, it's your heart up here. And it's called your cardia. Every reference to heart in the Bible, there's not one of them that has to do with your heart heart. Every single one of them has to do with your mentality of your soul. And what it means is that if you don't guard the Word of God um, in your mentality, which is where you put Bible doctrine, uh, you make yourself vulnerable in life. You make yourself very vulnerable. So, so it says to, to, um, to guard my Word, this is Bible doctrine, by means of perseverance. And remember, perseverance here is, is, to perverse, is to persevere in the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. The only place that a Christian is safe is in the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, the filling of the Holy Spirit. That's the only place you're safe. Mm -hmm. okay? Otherwise, you can be taken down. Okay? Because what happens when you're when the filling of the Holy Spirit is that it is the Holy <coughs> Spirit who guards and protects your, uh, your soul. Okay? He protects it. <coughs> um, I will also guard you, and this I hear, uh, Jesus, this is Jesus, I is here. I will also guard you, talking to Christians in general, uh, not just the, um, that's just not the uh, Philadelphia Christians, from the time, and the word here for time is an indefinite period, which means it's not defined. Okay, that's all indefinite means. It means that there's no time period on it. There's no specific time of trial uh, or of testing. Okay, now this testing here is the important part for us. It says, which is about to come, and it's about to come means that it's imminent, which means that it, it, will, it will definitely come, but the time is indefinite. Okay, which means that it doesn't mean it's long and definite. It means that it's undecided. Okay, <clears throat> undecided as far as we're concerned. Our perspective is that we don't know when the rapture is coming. We don't know when the tribulation is coming. We know none of that. Uh, God the Father knows. God the Son knows. God the Holy Spirit knows. They know all things. But that time is specifically picked by God to have its uh, perfect effect. Okay, but when God when when God's timing takes place. <clears throat> it has a perfect effect to it. Okay? Um, one of the things like with, with, with the death of a believer, when, when a believer walks with God, his death is perfectly timed in every direction. Now, um, what happens most of the time is somebody goes, well, that's too soon, I wanted to be with him more. But God knows all there is, and what he does is he makes that time so that the, the perfect timing is that very perfect moment for everybody surrounding it. And sometimes you can't see the perfect moment of God when you're in it. You can only see it when you're down the road. There's lots of things that I thought when they happened were the most horrible thing. I could not see a way out of them. And down the road, I looked back and I thought, that's the most wonderful thing that happened in my life. Uh, I just didn't know it at the time. You know, I think that that's uh, one of the things that God does for us is that He, he does that for us. If, if, if you walk with God and you listen to Him and you understand Him, um, He shows you those things. And He doesn't show it to you because he has nothing else to do. He shows it to you to have faith in future things that he's going to do. So because I had this one thing here that I saw that when I thought it was happening, my human viewpoint said it was horrible. But as I went down in time, God made me look back at it and said, was that as horrible as you thought? And I go, no, that was actually one of the best things that ever happened in my life. Because when you have trials in the future, he wants you to take that same viewpoint and experience and say, wait a minute, you know something, this really looks tough, but... I'm telling you, if it's happening to you, I knew it was going to happen to you, and it's going to be the best thing for you. It's just not going to be the best thing for you from your opinion right this minute. But your opinion will change as you, as you grow through. Okay, so that's what that part is. So, so God's going to put, uh, um, the Lord himself will protect us in that, in that time. It's also called the principle of the wall of fire. Uh, it means that when Christians walk with God, they have a wall of fire around them. Uh, one of the things I really like about that principle is it tells you, and this is, this is a, a doctrinal point, is that until the moment that you're going to die that's been decided by God, 
you cannot die no matter where you're at. Mm -hmm. Nothing can happen to you. You know, you could be, um, you can be anywhere. You could be in the worst battle. You could be in Normandy. You can be in the worst battle or place in the world. And in reality, you're as safe that moment as you are in your own bed. On the other hand, is when God's going to take you, there's nothing that's going to stop it either. So you can be in that same battle, or you can be in your bed all by yourself, and reality is that when it's time to go home, you're out of here. You know, so. God is also a terminal illness. Sometimes God uses that. Yeah. Sometimes, sometimes, that's, sometimes with people, I believe without reservation, is that God has given many people uh, in a terminal illness their last opportunity to, the great, to do their greatest witnessing to everybody around them. Mm -hmm. you know? mm -hmm. And that's a great honor. You know, if you look at the, 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 uh, the martyrs in Christianity, all of them have had really tough things. But some of those things are known by everybody because of the way they handled them. Mm -hmm. okay? So yeah, so that's really, that's very, very true. The, the other thing I like about that particular principle is that it should make you absolutely courageous. Mm -hmm. You know, is that in reality, you, you can know without, uh, without reservation or deviation mm -hmm. that whatever God has put in for you, He wants you to execute. And you can execute it absolutely with no fear whatsoever. Mm -hmm. so, uh, I, I personally uh, think a lot of that. Um, the testing which is about to occur on, um, in the translation, this should be the, it should, should be the Roman Empire because the word here we talked about last week is the word for the inhabited earth. Okay, which means that it's not going to be a disaster that's going to happen to the, all, the whole earth. It's going to happen to the inhabitants of the earth, okay, the people themselves, um, to test those who uh, live upon the earth. Okay, and this is, the, this is what I call it, a, a phase two testing. Um, whenever you look at your life as a Christian, you, you want to look at it from three places. You, know, you want to look at it from... What, what I, um, there's two pieces. Obviously, you're born here. Everybody has a start, right? And this is uh, called phase one. Okay? Phase one. And this is up to the point you become saved. Okay? And then um, phase two starts right here. And this is uh, phase two. And this is the part in reality that counts. Okay? And then you have uh, phase three. And that's eternity. This is when you die. Face the absence from the body, face to face of the Lord. This is salvation. So, one of the nice things um, to know is that everything that you have to learn and all the things of the time that you have to live for Christ happens right here. Mm -hmm. Nothing afterwards, nothing before, nothing you do before you say it counts for anything. Okay? But this period is a critical period, which means that where you're at this very moment, if you are alive as a believer, um, get moving. Get do something. Pay attention to what God has in front of you. This is, this is the part that counts. And the other side is that you will have, you will have trials here. And tri let's say tri tribulations, but it's another word for it. It's not true tribulations. Um, and you'll have testing here, and you'll have um, you'll have any kind of discipline in time if you happen to be an idiot. God disciplines idiots. Um, is that that can only happen in this room here? Bless you. That can only happen here. It can't happen here because over here, uh, over here in phase three is the absolute happiness of God. Okay, you, you, you have been fully consummated in your resurrection body, and the awards happen at the, at the uh, judgment seat of Christ. So it's an important kind of piece to take, uh, take into consideration there. Um, okay, so the word, um, the word here to tempt is to um, test something for good or evil. And, um, and it usually means to test under pressure, okay? So for here, um, for us, as Christians, we have a different uh, viewpoint of this. In reality, the testing that it's talking about that's going to happen to, the operative words are uh, whole world, okay? Whole inhabited world. Okay? And that it's a test. Okay? And this test here, it, it's talking about the, um, the tribulation, obviously by definition. This is a tribulation. Um, 
So it's after the rapture. And you remember what that is. Okay, mm -hmm. Shoot that button. So wherever we're at in time right now, we have the rapture, right? We have the second coming, we have the millennium. Okay, we have the tribulation. This is the part it's talking about right here. And this is the part that's going to happen to the inhabited world. Um, some of the things that's important to, to know about this is that, um, that all believers get removed from the earth during the, during the rapture. Okay? Which means that how many Christians are there on, on day two? Zero. Don't let him answer. It is not zero, zero, zero. Okay, uh, no Christians. In reality, from a uh, doctrinal point of view, there will be no Christians on the earth again. There will be a lot of okay. believers, though. We're going home. Yeah. There will be some believers, but they won't be there day one, and they will. Well, maybe depends on what time it happens, right? Um, but in day two, there'll be zero. Okay, the very first people who come to believe will not be Christians, right? Correct. No. What will they be? Believers. They'll be believers, but what kind of believers? Late tribulational uh, saints. Uh, tribulational saints, yeah, that's, that's one way to okay. But they will be, we will, because this is the 70th week, yeah. okay, that's the definition from uh, Daniel 9, 24 through 27, this will be the age of Jews. It's the age of Israel. <coughs> The last piece, the Jewish age, that's right. Okay. So, by definition, there can be no Christians. Okay? Because it's a very specific thing. Everybody who becomes a believer here, and there will be Jews and Gentiles, um, the Jews will fall under this dispensation. Okay? Um, and the Gentiles will fall under the same. They'll be proselytes in reality. And they will be initiated by the 144,000. Okay, we're all familiar with that. We'll, yeah. we'll cover that when we get to... Then we run into it in, in chapter 5, actually. Not too far away. But it gives you some idea of what this... This is the part that it's talking about right in here. It's talking about that I will bring the, uh, the testing on the entire world. I will... Um, the, the, and what is that test? Anybody know what that test is? What is that test? Okay. It's not a test for... Um, the, the test is not for um, growth or maturity, not that that is spiritual maturity. The test will be faith in Christ. Because what test does these people not pass? <coughs> They're there, right? <laughs> If you're if you are here on day two, guess what test you didn't pass? <laughs> Faith in Christ. You didn't pass it. That's why you're there. Okay. This period of time here will be the absolute worst time in all of history, second to nothing. The removal of the church will be removed. The removal of the Holy Spirit with respect to His restraining ministry on sin. Um, and think about it. In reality, uh, Christians. Not all Christians, okay, but the majority of Christians, even when they don't walk with God, actually have a dampening effect on evil. Most, most Christians, even if they are not holy, like God wants them to be, they are at least moral. Mm -hmm. So they have a dampening effect because of that, okay? God doesn't want us to be moral, God wants us to be holy, holy okay? And holy means to be like who? <coughs> like God, like Christ. That's right. Okay. So God, I'm not impressed with my own little. Uh, let's try red. Is the black bad too? Yeah, the black one's too. Yeah, just toss my. Uh, there's some down here. I wouldn't mind. I don't like red. Red kind of gets old after you look at it too long. It kind of too weird. So this is the this is the test here. This is the. The hour of trial. Okay? And this is why uh, Christianity is very straightforward. Is that this is why we won't be there. Why won't Christians be there? Because the test has to be given. We've passed it. That's why we're not there. Okay? Um, you don't give a person the test they've already passed. Okay? Um, an example of that, in my mind, is that a lot of people think that uh, Daniel in the lion's den was a test 
That was for him. Okay. Mm -hmm. Problem was that how old is how old is Daniel when he does the lion's test? Like he's like 82, 84, something like that. He's not a young man. I'm not saying that Charles is a young man. He's 82, 84, something like that. He's very young. When we know that, just from doing basic mathematics. You know, basic mathematics tells us when Darius was there, was king, and it tells us when uh, Nebuchadnezzar conquered Israel in his first conquest, which is 606 BC. And we know that he was a teenager, so he's somewhere between 14 and 17. And the distance between this one and this one is better than 70 years. Just math, just basic history of math, you know what it is. Okay? But this test in the lion's den was not for him, it was for this guy. There was no test for Daniel. Daniel did not sweat one tiny bit. He had passed, he had actually passed the death test when he was about 22. Remember, uh, that's when, um, when Nebuchadnezzar had a dream, and he says, I want you to tell me the dream. And they said, well, tell us the dream, we'll interpret it for you. And he says, no, Bosco, I'm not telling you the dream. You'll just make up this rubbish. You tell me what I dreamed. That's what he said. You know what they said to him? Nobody's ever done that, ever. Tell Daniel, okay, we can work on it. So you Shadrach, you Shadrach, and Benigo, and, and Daniel together, and they all pray about it, and God reveals the entire dream to him. Okay? Mm -hmm. If he had not answered that, all the magi would have been... Okay, so he passed that test at like 22. He didn't need that test again. This is a different test. This test is for Darius. Because Darius, Darius was a very moral and good man. The hardest person to convince that they need a savior is a moral and good person. Okay? Sinners, people who do sin uh, frequently, uh, even if it's their own style of sin, you know, not noticeable like drunk or something like that, but they have a, what they do realize is that when they come face to face with God, is that they're a sinner. They get it just like that. Okay? Um, so this is the test. And this is why they are this, at this test. And this is the test. What happens here is that there are people during this period whose objective in both pieces um, here that need to be saved. Okay? These people who are saved here, <coughs> under the 144,000, Okay, not, they won't be removed. They are actually kept. But they evangelize many, many, many people. And what happens is they become saved in this period, and then they go to the, the mountains that Daniel talked about. Okay? Mm -hmm. Now, all kinds of awful things happen here because this one Satan's here. And then all hell breaks loose, literally. Okay? Mm -hmm. And then more people are saved here. Okay? And they go over to become the people who populate the, the uh, millennium. That's okay. like God we giving us every single opportunity. Yeah, God, God is like that. God yeah. is like that. God gives us every single opportunity. Um, and, my, and my joke is, and I like this joke, because it's a funny joke, if you get it. Okay. <laughs> okay. is that if God needs to knock you off a horse from speaking to you from heaven in light, he will do that. Okay. <laughs> I don't think it's the best way to go. I think it's better to just listen, but he will do that for you. Um, and, and because we know he did that for, for Paul. That's what Paul needed. That's what called God delivered. If, if God needs to just almost kill you for you to pay attention to it, he will accommodate. Because he knows that the time on this side, eternity, is much more important than anything in that little tiny spot right there. This is what God calls the mist, that our lives are like a mist. Okay. It's like what you said before class, you can either learn it the hard way or the easy way. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. God has two lesson plans, okay? <laughs> lesson plan one is easy, okay? And this is the listen one, right? And lesson plan two is the hard one. Anybody know what the hard one is? Believe. Discipline. Obey. Pain. 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 <laughs> yeah. Lesson plan two is pain. Um, I can tell you clearly that I have spent much more time on this side than on the other side. But I'd like to always think that I'm, you know, I, I would be uh, open to the truth by just hearing it. But history seems to tell me it's not true. Okay. I, I listen better today than I did before. Okay, so let's go. Um, let's go further. Um, the time of testing um, for the church. You know, this is not the time of testing because we can tell it's not the time of testing because of the subject, right? Actually, this is the accusative this thing. It's the object of the subject. Okay? The whole inhabited world is going to be tested. Okay? That would be 
the tribulation. Where is our test at? Where does God reveal it our test? And this is in the second book verse. Um, if you remember, just turn to Revelation 2.10. 3.10? 2.10. And we've already covered this, right? We already studied this, so you guys have this down completely. In fact, we went through the whole list of this thing, remember. I actually identified every single one of those trials uh, in history because they're already behind us. They were specific to these people. But it says, um, where are we? Do not be afraid of what is about to, you are about to suffer. And this is suffer for blessing. Okay? It's important to know that there are two sufferings that people do. Okay? You suffer for blessings or you suffer for cursing. Okay? If you are being disciplined by God, that pain, that suffering, is what they call unbearable. Okay? That's how you can tell one from the other. It's unbearable. Okay? The suffering for blessing is not only bearable, but you can actually you actually have a comfort in it. You have this is the this is the part that says, uh, pray for the peace that passes understanding. Which means that if anybody's looking at you, they think, this must be horrible for you. And you're thinking, no, God's got me covered. Yeah, it's, it's really grievous. I'm really in pain. I, I, I'm really sorry. I have this great uh, uh, sadness. But I'm okay. I'll be fine. God's with me. I've got it covered. And this is what Paul says when he says, you know, I've gone, I've gone through a lot and I've gone through a little. And I've learned to be what? Content in either. I have a lot or a little, neither one of them. Which means that this is the, this is the part that it says um, in, in, in Philippians where it says, And the peace of God that passes all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Okay? That's what that part is. That the Lord himself will guard that. So that's what that part is. So this is 210 here, we have here, is, um, is the trials that they're being put in. So this is the part that they are suffering for blessing. They are suffering to become more mature. Okay? The object of, more, of being more mature in Christianity is so that you can fulfill God's plan more. And as a result of that, you will be given greater blessings from Him. We'll talk about it in the next verse. Okay, I tell you, the devil will put some of you uh, to prison to test you. Okay? So some of these Christians are going to prison. I personally believe that we're probably not that far off from that in our own society, and some of that some of you may actually find that's true. If things do not if things do not change, um, we may find Christianity being persecuted to the point of being put in prison. Okay, it's not rare. It happens everywhere else in the world. We just have been blessed by it because we live in a, in a country that has a constitution that is being mostly uh, <laughs> mostly is still there. Okay. But that may not always be true. Uh, you will suffer persecution for 10 days. Now, the day here does not mean 10 days. Um, very seldom does the word day mean day. Okay? It's the context that decides that. Example of that is that how long is the day of the Lord? A thousand years. It's a thousand years. That's why, that's why, that's why in 2 Peter it says, a day as to the Lord... It's a thousand years. That's what he says. That. He gives you that definition. So many times days are not days. Sometimes uh, the day of salvation is how long? It's not even a second. Yeah, the day, my day of salvation was that long. I believe done. It wasn't a day. It was 24. It wasn't even seconds. I don't know how long it was. It was very long. So it says, and he tells me, it says, be faithful even to the point of death. This is dying blessing. Okay? Be faithful to the point of death. And I will give you the crown of life. Okay? And that is a, um, an award, the, tribal, uh, the, the crown of life. We'll actually talk about it next verse uh, we come to. I think it's the next verse. Yeah. Um, so it, it tells us that in, the, in these trials that it's talking about in 2.10, which are specifically spoken to the church, that those trials will have this, this, and that. Though there's going to be this many of them. And he's talking to the church in general. The seven churches he's talking about. As the church moves forward, they will have these. And we listed those, if you remember. I, I gave you all ten of them, what years they would be, who were the persecution. They're actually history. They're, they're human history, so we know that they're there. Um, so we know when ours are, and we know that this is not it. Okay? We know that once we're talking in this context, <coughs> is the, these other tribulations. Okay. In reality, you don't take a test you've already passed. And that's what that's, what that's at. Um, we also know that tribulation is part of prophecy, right? 
-hmm. This is Five of Prophecy. Mm -hmm. All over. This is called uh, uh, Jacob's Trouble. Okay. It's called Tribulation. It's talking about in Daniel, Ezekiel, uh, Isaiah. I mean, it's just all over the place. Okay. Which makes it in what's called prophecy. We also know that there's no prophecy for the church. We're on bookends. Okay. In reality, what it means is that the church happened with the coming of the of Pentecost of the Holy Spirit. And we are removed from the earth on the bookend of the beginning of the, of the coming of the Lord, the Lord's Day, okay? Beginning of the tribulation. So it is not actually part of ours, we're just, it, it's just our bookend, okay? In reality, there are no prophecies here. There are, there are um, no temples to be built. <laughs> There's no uh, union. There's no gathering together of the Jews. Okay, that, that that's not true. And that it may be historically true, but it has nothing to do with us. Okay, <coughs> the gathering of the Jews in reality um, happens over here. Okay, it happens on that side. Okay. But it's in Ezekiel. So we know that there's no prophecy, but you also know that because there's no prophecy, and this is in prophecy, that this is not <coughs> Christianity. It's just telling us this there. Yeah. So this time is also a time of judgment. Is that the same as testing? Um, yes, in this case it is. Okay. In reality, it sounds like in reality, the judgment is multifold. The judgment is on Satan, right? And his and his demons, remember? Because they, they actually what happens is that they are restricted. They're thrown out of, out of heaven right here at the abomination of desolation. Remember what that is? Abomination of desolation. That's where in the temple, uh, in the temple, the tribulational temple, that there will be set up a um, an idol to the beast, the beast dictator. Okay. And this is the part that Matthew twenty five talks about. This is the part that Daniel talks about. And, when, and this is part of what Revelation says, is that when you see that, run. Okay, run to the mountains. Okay? So it's a very specific time. And Satan and the demons get restricted to earth for the first time in history. They can't get off. Right now they have free, free reign. We know that from the book of Jacob, right? We know that from the book of Zechariah. The book of where, Jacob. Hmm? The book of Jacob. No, Book of Job. Thank you. Book of Jacob. Yeah, that's a new book. I'm just coining that new book. Uh, the book of Job, sorry. Hey, that's, Job, let's write that down so we can know that. And it's also in, in Zechariah, okay? uh, like chapter two or three. Uh, but we know that maybe this is when Satan's going to have the conversation with, with the Lord, saying, and, and, and uh, the Lord says to him, he says, Have you seen Job? Have you seen my man Job? He is a righteous man. And what Satan say? He let me kick his butt a little bit. We'll see how righteous he is, right? <laughs> but the conversation's happening one on one with God the Father and, and Satan, and that is happening in heaven. Okay? So we know he has access to that. Uh, it's funny. Uh, we talked about I think the last week went before that Satan is the ruler of the world. He's the ruler of the world as it is today, but he doesn't like spending much time here apparently. You know, and he's really really angry when he's restricted to it. So the wrath of God gets poured on him. But it also gets poured on the Jews. Why the Jews? Because they rejected this test. And have for many, 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 yeah, many, many. Yeah, two millennium now. Mm -hmm. okay? um, this is one of the reasons that they have so many struggles. If you, re if you reject the Christ, you have those struggles. And also to Gentiles who are having to be left over as unbelievers. Okay? These are the because anybody who hasn't passed the test, okay, pass, no pass, no pass, haven't passed it, haven't passed it, haven't passed it. Actually, there's no test for them. They're just getting punished, okay? Um, and there are people in both of these categories in the tribulation who will get that test, who will pass it, and either go to heaven, many of them, we know them as tribulational believers, or some of them will actually live over through the tribulation, through the second coming, and they will live for a thousand years, Okay. Uh, remember that piece in Isaiah? A, a young man who dies at a hundred will be considered just a child. Okay. So the restoration of the world will take place. The restoration, the, the things that we now have that that's, that prevents us from living uh, more than like 120 will be removed. So 
But this is where that thing is focused on. And we are not in prophecy, which is one of the reasons that I've let you know that. It doesn't apply to Christians, even though it's written in here. It is written for our instruction. Okay, so we know what's going on. Why do we have such favor with God? It's because we are his family. Okay, we are the personal children of God. Um, the ones that die in a hundred, they're not believers, are they? No, they are. They're well, they may or may not be. The ones who die at... Um, the only reason that people will die in the, in the tribulation, uh, I mean tribulation, in the millennium, will be capital punishment. People who have violated the law on a capital offense, and they will be executed. Complete justice. Other than that, there's no diseases. Nobody will be sick. Nobody will be old. Won't we'll exist anymore. I, I've so seen, yeah, those who die will die in capital punishment. I, I've seen those say that if they die at a hundred, it's because they're not saved. Those who yeah. are saved. People who, the, the people, justice, the justice of God in time, okay, will punish those both believers and unbelievers who commit capital offense. This is the, this is the iron scepter, right? The difference is, the only thing that's really going to stink for these people with the iron scepter is that the iron scepter will have omniscience. Okay, remember what omniscience means? It means he knows everything. So you'll go, I didn't do it. He said, yes, you did. <coughs> Dead. That'll be it. That'll be the end of it. You know, it won't be any arguing with it. Because you can't argue with omniscience. People can't, you can't lie to omniscience. Because there'll still be sin. Yeah, there'll still be sin, yeah. As long as there's what, there'll be sin. Volition. As long as there's volition, there will be sin in the world. Okay? That's always true. Um, if you remember... Volition is the cause of sin, not the sin nature. Okay, how do we know that? The garden, right? Was there any sin nature in the garden? No, nothing. Right? What what was there in the garden? Volition. Volition. The angel, the first angel, Lucifer. Was there sin nature there? No. What was there? All, all the demons who, who crossed over from from God to Satan. What was there? No sin nature, but there was volition. Yeah, so religion is the cause of sin. All your sin nature can do is tempt you. You have to say yes to fall. Okay, that's the part when Paul is talking about how that, that sin starts in your head, in, in your sin nature, in your thinking, and then it becomes pregnant. And the pregnant is that you allow yourself to be tempted by it, but it does not become a, the birth does not take place until you choose it. Until you choose. Is the same thing in James? Hmm? Yeah. Um, okay, so, principles here. This is a principle that's always, always true. <laughs> and you would think that, uh, uh, that some of this would... Christianity does not know some of these principles, which drives me nuts, okay? But in reality, uh, if you ask most Christians, you know, what's the cause of sin? The first thing that comes out of the mouth is what? Sin nature, okay? But if you actually examine the scriptures, you know that that can't be true because there's no sin nature in the garden, even for us. Okay? Um, but there's lots of other things. They don't, they don't understand the power of this. The power of volition is that your volition is the guardian of your soul. Okay? You are personally and individually <coughs> responsible for all of your decisions, no matter what has happened to you. Okay? Whether you lived in the greatest house or the lost house, whether your parents, your parents were murderers or not, whether your parents were both great Christians or not, it doesn't make any difference. Reality is that you make that choice. You choose your own destiny. You choose your own punishment. Okay? If you choose poorly, there are negative consequences on that, always. Whether you're a believer or you're an unbeliever, it doesn't make any difference. Okay? If I close my eyes out and walk, walk down the middle of that street, I'm going to get hit, no matter how much I believe in Jesus Christ. I'll just go to heaven. But I'll be just as stupid as any other believer who did the same thing, right? <coughs> yeah, it doesn't make any difference. Um, volition is such that, remember we talked about this, individuals and nations are the result of their own decisions. Problems we have in this country is because of the stupid decisions that we have made as citizens <coughs> and as our leaders. We have voted these idiots in, okay? We need to vote them out when they make bad decisions. 
And how can you tell they're bad decisions? All you have to do is open your newspaper. Okay? You'll see them very clearly. Everybody's responsible for their own decisions. Okay. Yeah. This this is why um, this decision is so important is that we in Christianity we make a lot of mistakes. Okay. One of those mistakes is thinking that somehow if if I ha if I am a wonderful Christian husband and that you are. <laughs> 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 but, but my wife but my wife chooses not to walk with God. I cannot make her stay married to me. I cannot make her be holy. Nor can she, a, a wonderful woman like my wife, cannot make me a holy husband. See, uh, we both have volitions. And how do you know that? You have this man named Hosea. Remember Hosea? The guy who writes that book, the God writes that book. Do you remember his wife? Remember her? Gomer? What was Gomer? What was Gomer? She was a prostitute. Okay? What did Jose find out? He went finding all his time getting her away from other men. Did he ever change her mind? No, ever. Okay. Did it make Did it make Hosea one tiny bit less holy? God had him write this book. His name's in that book. He wrote it. He was in the upstanding. Why? Because we had one here, Gomer, married to one here. <laughs> That's, that's just how it is. This is true with your children, too. In reality, one of the things you see in the scriptures, if you look real good, and we have all this garbage goop about children, too, is that if both of their parents <coughs> choose wisely, and I'm not saying they will, I'm just saying that's possible, you can yield a child with a negative volition. Okay? This is Hezekiah. We don't know his wife. This is Manasseh. Worst ruler in history. Okay? He has uh, two, two, I can't remember his, I can't remember his uh, grandson's name. But he, his grandson, and his grandfather were both very, very evil. And they had a son at eight years old. Josiah, the second greatest king in history. Okay? Everybody around him is rotten to the core. Yet he makes this thing. And he is only second to David. He is the reason that Nebuchadnezzar didn't come on the scene 40 years earlier and white Jews will not. It's because of this one man. And God talked to him and said, I will preserve everything for you until you come home to me. How many, anybody know his sons? He had five sons. That's funny, I have five sons. <laughs> okay, do you want to see what the five sons did? Negative. No! All five sons. Guess what happened here? 586 B.C. The destruction of Israel. Total and complete. God said, you know something? I'm going to bless you because you're blessed. But you know something? When, you're, when you die, you're going to have each one of your idiot sons on the throne. Which you did. And God sat there and said, okay, you know something? I'm done. And some of these had some really horrible endings. Um, this guy was thrown over the wall. And his, uh, he, he was eaten by dogs. Uh, this one had his eyes. Uh, no, 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 this one did. Uh, this was his, his actual idiot grandson. Um, and this guy here, he had, uh, Nebuchadnezzar said, you know something? I was gracious to you. I was kind to you. All I want you to do is do, do what you told me you would do. You did not do it. So I'm going to take all your five sons. Okay? Five sons. I'm going to execute them. I'm going to cut their throats in front of you. I'm going to burn out your eyes, and I'm going to let you live so that you remember what disobeying me means. That's the start of terrorism. That's pretty cool. Huh? <laughs> you know what I mean? I'm betting that the vassal kings and the rest of his kingdom all obeyed just like that. That's yeah. what I'm thinking. Anyway, so it tells you, what does it tell you? It tells the volitions everything. That's the whole point of this thing, is that you choose your own heart. If, you're, if you are not happy with your life, guess what? You chose it. Okay? Uh, God didn't make you happen to you. You chose it. Is that, yeah, you may have had a jerk father, grandfather, mother, whatever, whatever. But God says, and says guess what? You're now the chooser. It's up to you. What do you want to do? What do you want to do with your life? I'll tell you the best way to do it. But you, can, but you have the right to ignore it. All the people in this thing here will have ignored it. That's how they got there. 
This isn't, this isn't some tragedy of history that, oh, I'm the victim. No, no, you rejected Christ. That's the only reason you're there. Don't have to tell you. There are no tragedies in reality. We as individuals choose our own misery, our own happiness. Okay? Nations, because we are a collective of individuals, choose the same way. Okay? All you can do is choose for yourself. You can't choose for anybody else. So if you have a gomer, okay, if you have a gomer in your life, God tells you, I want you to choose rightly. And I will be your husband or your wife. I will make you happy. I will make you content. Choose me. You can't choose for them. You can't choose for these. You can just choose me. And God is the most faithful of any being ever, both in time and eternity. So, take responsibility. Taking responsibility for your decisions is, is maturity. It's the definition of maturity. Okay? Take responsibility for your decisions. When you screw up, it doesn't mean you have to keep screwing up. I used to tell my sons all the time, says, just because you were stupid once doesn't mean you have to stay stupid. Right? Change. Make a mistake. No matter how stupid the mistake is, you're still alive. I got an idea. Change your decision-making process so that you don't do that again. And that's, that's true. And some have learned and some have not. Right, Mark? <laughs> that was that was an interesting. Now do my brothers would. <laughs> okay, so arrogance. One of the problems with arrogance: rejection of God, rejection. I'll just put this way: rejection of the ultimate truth. Okay, is arrogance. It's arrogance. What you learn about arrogance is this: is that. If you are arrogant, you are unteachable by definition. You're unteachable. Even if God were to try to hand you the perfect truth, you would reject it. Because arrogance becomes blind and rejects truth. This is why when Paul's talking to the Bereans, he says that you have a responsibility to listen to the truth, whatever that truth is being given to you, and to see if it is true, not false. To see if it's true. Because if you always examine something to be false, if God gives you a truth, you can never hear it. Make sense? So it means you have to have an open mind. Christians are required to be flexible. Okay? We are dogmatic in principle, but we are flexible in life. Does that make sense? Um, okay, so in testing, the rules become in testing. In the tribulation for Christians, that testing is specific and is specific to the church by context, like we found in Revelation 2.10. In the tribulation, it is wholly, whole, it is specific to Jews. Okay? And that's how you can tell which one it's talking about here. You have to define that. Okay? So, verse 11. Tribulation is specific. It, it is, what is the tribulation called in the Bible? Jacob's trouble. Jacob's trouble. It's specific to them. Okay? God sat there and said, you know something? You're my people, and guess what? The gig's up. I'm done messing with this. That's the summary of the about, about 25 chapters of the Bible. Right there. What about those who are not Jews living through tribulation? Consequential. They, they are there just because they're rejecting Christ. <coughs> Everybody has the right to except to reject, right? It's universal. They're only there because at the time of the tribulation, they rejected Jesus Christ. So they're there. The wrath of God, remember what the scripture says, the wrath of God abides on you if you're not saved. If you reject Christ, the wrath of God abides on you. Which means that you don't get rid of it. You can't get rid of it. You can only get rid of it by paying Christ. Um, I am coming soon. Hold on to what you have so that no one will take your crown. And the four words I was looking at on this one here. Um, mind if I erase some of this stuff? Because I don't. Well, I might still need some of that, but I'll just kind of erase some of this stuff here so we have to leave it um, So, I'm coming soon is one of the words. It's here. Uh, hold on. 
no one to be crowned. These are pivotal words. I like to bring out the pivotal words because if you can't identify who those pivotal words are, you're kind of lost in the sentence, right? You don't know what he's talking about. So the object is always to find the critical words that tell you what means what. Okay? So I, obviously, is Jesus Christ, right? Yes. Yes, Jesus Christ. We know that by the definition of who's talking. Soon. Hmm. Now, this is an interesting word because when was this word written? 96 A.D. Oh, we're going down. Right there. 96 A.D. Well, I don't know about you, but if I'm asking for dinner soon, I'm thinking something a little better than 2,000 years. Um, so, obviously, the context as we normally see it is not a normal interpretation, right? This right here, soon, where it's better to word, use the word uh, eminent, okay? Means that it is definitely going to happen, okay? It could happen anytime. And this is the, called the eminency of the rapture. Eminency of the rapture means that the rapture could happen at any time. Okay, because that's when God's going to come, that's when Lord Jesus Christ is going to come for us. It is imminent. It means that it can happen any time. It could always have happened any time. The only thing that it is waiting for is for God the Father to say, perfect, this is the time. Now, you know, we can, we can whine about that. Um, but one thing I like to look at is that, you know something, if, if the Jews... I'm just talking about Richard Fenimore's viewpoint. If the Jews had not rejected the Christ, and, and, the, and the millennium had been ushered in, in 30 AD, guess who there wouldn't be? A church. A church. Us. Okay? None of us would have been born. We would not have been necessary. Okay? So, I'm, perfect, I'm perfectly okay with the eminency of the rapture. Okay? I'm fine with it just floating down. Because what it will do is that God the Father is the only one who will know when the very last Christian will be saved. Okay, when that happens, the rapture will take place. God's known, God the Father has, God in general, the Trinity, has known that time and place and per person for a hundred trillion, quadri if I knew more numbers, I'd be, you know, uh, ten, to the, ten to the infinite. In reality, if you know mathematics, in reality, God has known this long. Ten to the infinite. Okay? Um, I think you have to get to like the ten to what ten to like ten to like the seventeenth would be all the molecules in the universe. Like it's, it's a pretty good sized number, okay? So uh, this is a big number. So God has always known. There's never been a time that God did not know. God has always known. He has always known everything that was going to happen always and forever. Okay? And this is why Romans 8:28 is so important to us. And we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him. Okay, Not everybody, those who love him. And in this case, it is not believers only, it is those who love him. Which, to love God is to obey him. That's what Jesus, de Jesus defined this for us. If you love me, obey me. Okay? So this is, the, this is a set of believers that this Romans 8.28 applies to. So in reality, it's because God knows all things. He has the ability. He has always known all things. He knew all things back then. God has never, ever learned anything. Ever. He's never corrected. He's never made a mistake. And there's nothing ever new to him. Okay? So the joke I used to have, in reality, if one electron flies off and goes where we don't think it's supposed to do, God has known that forever. Has always known that. If an antler falls off an ant, why is six feet down under the ground? God has always known that. There's never been a time he didn't know that. Okay? There are no uh, escapee molecules. There are no escapee electrons. God knows exactly wherever they are and has always known that. That's him as a def definition. Okay? And because that, he knows all things. And has always known things. Even though we don't like the way things happen, in reality, God has always known that. If you live by this principle, which God does, then in reality, you have to let people and things make choices, right? If you live by volition, you have to allow things. It doesn't mean that you don't know how they're going to end up. You do. You always know. There's never been a time you didn't know. But if you're going to allow this, why do you have to allow for volition? 
Why do you have to love for a relationship? Why do I have to make it my choice? Why? It's because if I remove volition, God becomes responsible for what? Everything. 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 If God controls all there is and volition goes away, He is now responsible for everybody. I'm not, re I'm not responsible. That's right. I can be as evil as I want to be because I'm not responsible. God made me. He made me that way. If He sends me to hell, He's responsible. If He doesn't let me choose, it's not mine to choose. It's His. Yeah, it's Calvinism. This is Calvinism, by the way. Oh, yeah. Probably shouldn't go too far down this road. You know, oh, right. <laughs> but in reality, so that's why volition is in play. Okay? Now, volition is a problem to us, but it's not a problem to an omniscient God. No problem whatsoever. I can only, he allows it to play itself out. I can only speak for myself, but others may experience the same thing. When we hear about volition, 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 we've always been hearing about it with you. But there comes a time when all of a sudden you get hit in the middle of the forehead with volition and what it really means. Yeah. It's painful. Yes. <laughs> I agree. I, I personally would rather give it all to God and let him make the decisions, you know, but it doesn't, it doesn't seem to be in his, uh, in his thing. So I am coming to you, hold on to what you have, so that no one will take your crown. And the Greek for this is, a, um, is uh, I come quickly. Okay. Hold on to what you have in order that no one will take it away, your crown. Now the word here is, the, is, is taku, is the word, to have. it means quickly or at once or soon. And it, it is the definition that, in the context, for, for eminency. It means that it can happen any time and it's open. In reality, the rapture could happen tonight. It could happen before we finish the class. That would be better because we get a much better lesson by Paul in heaven than you're getting here today. But for now, you're stuck with me, right? <laughs> so you can always pay for next Sunday, though, right? <laughs> um, so, so, so it's the eminency part. Um, and it says, to come here is the word that Eric mind, but it means, it's the present active predicament, which means that uh, keeps on coming, okay? Which means the same thing as eminent, is that it's always there. It's not, it's not a end point, it is a moving point, okay? The... Um, uh, let me see here. Now, when it says hang on here, um, hang on, it's the same thing that this is talking about. Hang on is to endure. It's to endure. Endure where? Endure in the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. Okay? Endure. When you endure in the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, Another word, the biblical word for fellowship with the Holy Spirit is called the filling of the Holy Spirit. When you are filled with the Holy Spirit, you are God-powered. That's, that's God's whole purpose. Okay? The power that Jesus Christ had when he obeyed God the Father's plan, and he lived on the earth, and he went to the cross, this is, what, this is the power he had. Jesus the man... Remember, we've talked about this. Jesus, the man, never, never used his own power. Never used the second person's power. Ever. Not one time. Okay? Because if he had, the system that God the Father had for us in the time of Christianity would have always been less. It's the problem. Why didn't you use the power of the Holy Spirit? Why did you have to use your power? Why do you have to use the power of the Son, the second person? Okay. He did not use that because if he had, he would have foiled the plan. This is why, this is what Satan, in the desert when Satan's antagonizing him, that's what he's trying to get him to do. He's trying to get him to say, you know, can, can God make these rocks become bread? Right. Sure he can. Now, that's not a test for me, right? I can't do that. <laughs> Satan can do that all day long. But it's not going to change anything because I can't do that. But he can. Okay. So what he's trying to get him to do is get out of this power system and go to that power system. Okay? One that's in perfect union with the humanity. But Jesus said, and does not live by bread alone, right? But by <clears throat> but every word that comes from the mouth of God. So what does that tell us? The second power is the word of God. 
This is the other part he lived. He lived by the instructions of his father, God the Father, and he lived by the power of the Holy Spirit, and he chose them. Same choice. Isn't that interesting? That's the same choice we have. The identical choice that we have. Okay? No difference. Okay? And that's why Jesus had, did, had it done that way. That's why God the Father had it, that way, had it done that way. To have, um, to what you have. He says, um, hold on to what you have. And what he's talking to here is that, if you've noticed, there has been no criticism of the Philadelphian believers. So what they have at this point in time is... Spiritual maturity. There's not one critical word in this verse to them, the Philadelphian believers, not one negative verse. Why? Because the people who he's speaking to in this church, and this church is the most mature church of the seven. Maybe the most in the world. Okay? So he's saying, things are going to happen. Don't lose your maturity. Don't let it falter. Remain inside the filling of the Holy Spirit. Remain inside the truth of God. Stay there. Stay there so that you do not lose the crown that you're going to get. They have it. But they have to persevere to the end. Why the end? Guess what? If there's a hundred yard dash and I run 99 of them, <coughs> That's called, no, I lose, that's right. I stopped working. Everybody just go by. You didn't even finish the race. Didn't even finish the race. Do I get anything? No. Get laughed at a lot. Yeah, people think it's pretty funny. You could have just fallen, Richard. You just fall that direction. To the end. Because you get an award at the end. When you have completed the race. And we'll talk about that next week. Okay, finish up this verse. I don't think we might get through the rest of this next week. Hopefully, that'd be kind of cool. It'd be nice to go on to Laodicea. Okay, let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you for your great love for us. Lord, help us to um, help us remember the truth that you give to us. Help us to choose wisely. I'd like to say any fool chooses rightly, but that's not true. I pray us not to be fools but to choose rightly, mm -hmm. to choose what you put before us, mm -hmm. to, um, to take all the blessings that you have both in time and eternity because your love is great enough to give us that. Mm -hmm. I ask this in Jesus' name who did that perfectly. Amen. Amen. Amen.